her name is Sharon, so could you can we, we pray for Sharon? Okay. And, um, All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, your your phone sounds better now. So uh, okay. as long as we leave it like that, it, it sounds okay. And okay. Uh, okay. Anybody else before we go into prayer, and then we're going to go into worship. Okay. So let, let's go ahead and just. Uh, <laughs> oh, we're getting still a little feedback from you, brother Kelvin. So I'll just I'll mute you here. You, you can put uh, uh, your phone. I'm, 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 I'm muted. Yeah, I'm muted. Okay. Perfect. Okay, let me go ahead and pray here. Uh, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for gathering us here, Lord God. Your word says for two or three are gathered uh, in the name of Christ Jesus, your son, that you're here. And I just pray that you would continue to be with us, Lord, on this Bible study, that you would just feed us with your own hand, Lord. Father, I pray that you would bless the worship tonight. I pray that you would bless, Lord God, the uh, fellowship, Lord God, that you would also just Feed us, Lord, from your word, Lord. We're just hungry to know you, to know more about you, to draw closer to you. Your word says that if we draw closer to you, that you would draw closer to us. Father, you know, this whole Bible study is about uh, uh, King David. We're seeking to know how we loved you, Lord God, and how we sought a man who was after your own heart. Lord, we do lift up uh, Brother John. He's asking that uh, you give him the mind of Christ, Lord God that he would have the desires, Lord God, that you would have him to have, and Lord God, that uh, you would just give him grace and gifts, Lord God, to lead that Christian life. Father, we pray for Sister Leslie, Lord. She's asking for your touch upon uh, her daughter Emily, that you would bring conviction of heart, remorse, repentance, and the faith to believe that she too would be a child of God. Lord, we lift up uh, Sister Felicia's mother, Lord God, and her health issues. We pray that you would just touch her now, Lord, and give her strength and healing in her body, Lord. Father, and we do lift up Brother Calvin's uh, co-worker. Uh, she's had a death in her family. Lord, we just pray that you would comfort them. But even more than that, Lord, that you would show them and make it clear that uh, life is very frail, Lord God, and that we all need to call and be right with you, Lord God, through Christ Jesus the Lord, so that we can be forgiven and begin eternal life now, Lord. Help them, Lord God. We ask all these things, Lord God, and a blessing upon your word, and a blessing upon those that made the call, and those that were not able to make the call. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, and so uh, let's do this. Uh, Brother Donnie, do you have a, word, a song to lead us in worship here? Yes, I do. I'm going to do a song called Overcome, and it's by Jeremy Kemp. And here it is. Hey, Donnie. Yeah. Hey, we, sorry, let me just read this. I wanted to read this again. Because it's so important. Uh, John 4, if you remember the, the woman at the well, she came and, and she, was, she was talking to the Lord Jesus. She didn't know who he was. But she, he said this to her. But he said, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And so we know this, that you have to be born again, right? Because then your spirit is born again, and you're born again by the power of the Holy Spirit through faith in Christ Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. But in truth, that's important, because he wants to be worshipped out as he is. And so Brother Donnie called me earlier to do a little sound check, and he was just, you know, singing the song because we were going over just the levels. But I was listening to the song, and I was like, man, there's just so much truth in that song. And I, it just stuck in my head, and I just kept singing it, even though after Brother Donnie hung up. And so he's going to bring forward this song, and just really listen to the words. Because there's just so much truth in this. I hope it all blesses it all. Okay, Brother Donnie. Amen, hey here we go. <laughs> Father's 
Sheldon, can you read today? Yes, sir. All right. That's what we'd like to hear. Okay. And, oh, this is Sister Leslie. How can I miss Sister Leslie? Okay. Uh, and, uh, oh, Brother John, too. Brother John, can you read today? I would like to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So here is, here's, uh, let's be missing somebody else. Okay. So here is Michelle, Jacob, Deborah, Sophia, Juan Raul, Donnie, Patricia, Calvin, Leslie, and John. Okay. So we're, we're, you guys go ahead and move over to First Samuel 31. And what I'll do is uh, I'll just kind of do a recap. And so this is from, uh, last time. And so it's just important to keep the continuity going here. But we saw David go, oh, let's make sure we have a phone on mute here, and then just unmute yourself when you're ready to uh, read. Okay, so we saw David go to the land of the poop. Somebody still has their phone on. And so just remember to put your phone on mute, please. Okay. I can't tell who it is, but there you go. There, now we're now we're pressing clean. Okay, so we saw David go to the land of the Philistines. And Saul did not pursue him anymore, right? And so uh, David uh, pretended to go and attack different areas uh, of Israel, but really he continued to attack and pillage the enemies of God. And so we, we saw that he wasn't being entirely truthful on that, but David is the one that said, Blessed is the man who the Lord does not impute sin. And so again, that's scriptural, right? Because God forgives us, right? Not because of anything from ourselves, but because... Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, has died for us. We saw that God did not speak to Saul anymore because his judgment was about to hit. And so Saul, instead of repenting, went out and sought a witch to bring him up to Prophet Samuel, continuing to put his trust in a man and not God. Okay? And so, of course, we know that that's, like, super dangerous. In Jeremiah 17, it says this, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and the salt land, which is not inhabited. Okay, so here we go. How many people want to be like a shrub in the desert? Anybody on this call? No. Oh, no. 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 That's, not, that's not a good enough place to be. In fact, he contradicts that. With, some, uh, with a tree that's planted by the river as uh, someone who's trusting the Lord. And that's what we want to be, right? Brother, Je we Brother saw, Jesse, uh, yep. what Ed verse is that? Jeremiah 17, what? Five. Okay, thank you. Yep. We saw that uh, the, the witch, in fact, uh, did bring up Samuel. And again, there's some controversy whether she was able to do it or, you know, the Lord allowed it or he did it. We're not quite sure. But we, one thing that we do know is that Saul asked her to bring up Samuel, and he came up. And he said, why did you bring me up for my rest? And he, he told him that Israel was going to lose the battle, and that Saul and his son will die and be, will be with him. And so what he meant by with him is that we saw in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man that there were in a place called Hades. And the rich and Lazarus was with Abraham. But the rich man was in the same place, but on the other side. And he was in torment. And that's what he was speaking of. But because before the Christ, before the, the, the cross of Christ, that's where the believers would go. They would go to the other side, and they were awaiting one thing before they can go to heaven. Anybody remember what they were waiting for? To be justified? Right. And how are they justified? Who had to die? Jesus. I... Right, Jesus the Christ, right? And that's why, I remember when he died and he said it is finished, the veil ripped from the temple, and all those people, right, we don't know at what time, but they ended up going up to heaven, because we know as believers, Paul says that if we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. So it's different. In those times, they, had, they waited there with Abraham. But for us believers now, when we die, we're instantly in the presence of the Lord. It's so interesting the way that that scripture goes. It says, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's almost like the Lord Jesus can't wait to be the first one to say, here, you're here with me now. Because we're instantly in his presence. Not in heaven. I mean, we're in heaven, but it doesn't say we go to heaven. It doesn't say we're in the presence of angels. It says we're in the, in the presence of the Lord, which is the Lord Jesus, right? 
we also saw that God had now become Saul's enemy. And that really, really, like we said, no bueno. That's no bueno. And he will be, con and he was condemned, right? It was so bad that we saw that even the witch, who was a real witch, working with demonic spirits and familiar spirits, felt sorry for him and tried to comfort him. And we talked about that. You know you're in a bad, bad place when a witch has to try to comfort you, right? And so I was just looking at that and just thinking about that, like, man, that, he went from being king to seeking a witch, and then when she, he got the bad news, the witch had to come and comfort him, right? But it's kind of like the same deal right now, because there's like thousands and thousands of Christians who are seeking their comfort in, in entertainment, and a lot of that is through those Harry Potter books and movies. Isn't that interesting? And it still continues on. And God hates witchcraft. He is a jealous God. In fact, I was talking to a, a sister, you know, a few days ago, and she was just, man, for whatever reason, she was just looking up just little images, and it was just these little uh, fairies. That's all it was. And, but the Lord spoke to her heart and said, what is that? And he's jealous. And he said, that's not an idol you're looking at, right? And she said, no. And so, but she put away her phone. He is a jealous God, and especially for anything that has to do with the occult. And I'm telling you, the enemy is very crafty, and he's bringing it all in right now. Even through corporate trainings, they talk about centering and all that stuff is just New Age. You know, Brother Potts came out of the New Age, and you could have talked to him. But a lot of these trainings, these HR trainings, human resources trainings, all those different things, they use that stuff because the Lord made that clear that they're going to start bringing in those middle, uh, those far eastern mysticism techniques, and they're coming into the church even. Okay, we saw David try to join the fight against Israel with the Philistines, but God stepped in and did not allow it, and so he and his men went home, only to find that the group of people had taken his wife, his children, his livestock, livestock, all that they had, right? By the way, who was that group of people? Anybody remember? The Amalekites. That's right. It was the Amalekites. And who was supposed to kill all the Amalekites initially? Saul. Saul. That's right. See how God knows everything? That's why he wanted them killed. They attacked Israel from the backside. All their, their old people and their little children and the ones that were limping and hurt and the handicapped people, all the people in the wheelchair, that's who they attacked. And so God wanted them destroyed. And he said that forever will be my enemy. And he gave Saul that commandment, but they didn't do it. And so now we see some of those people still, and they went and they attacked David. Those were the Amalekites, right? We saw that David was in a deep distress. Because not only did he lose everything, but his own men wanted to stone him. See, that's, that's so powerful, too, because I can see those things happening, right? We've been there where there's some bad circumstances, one after another after another. But in this case, his number one guy, these mighty men that are super loyal, they also talked about stoning him, right? And so, again, we saw that God allowed all this for a purpose. But one of the things, the reason I think he allowed this is to show him that even his own mighty men, the ones that were super loyal to him and said, you know, brother, I got you, no matter what, I'm yours, I'm here with you. But after they lost their wives, their kids, and all their stuff, they're like, hey, that's all his fault. And they wanted to stone him. And so what did David do? We know what he didn't do. He didn't go to his bartender. He didn't go to the therapist. He didn't go to the counselor. He didn't go to his pharmacist. He didn't go to his financial advisor. He didn't even go to his doctor, right, for medication, for none of that stuff. He didn't do none of that stuff. What he did do, the Bible says, is he simply encouraged himself in the Lord. See, that's the difference between David. Because I know me, I start calling my resources and start relying on my talent. But not David. David said, I'm just going to go to him because he's all that matters. So he first encouraged himself in the Lord. And then later he went to the priest and asked for an ephah. Let me ask, we'll ask God what he wants us to do. In Psalm 27, verse 13, it says this, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land 
land of the living. Not in heaven, but in the land of the living. Verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Amen. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Okay, very good, right? And so who wrote that, by the way? Anybody know? Comes from Psalm 27. King David. David did. There you go. Yeah, it was King David. See how David is living out the scriptures even before they're being written out? He's living them out. It's just amazing. Okay, so he asked the priest for the ephod, they consult the Lord, and the Lord says, Surely I will give them into your hands. We saw that David, uh, uh, then they went over there, right? Remember? 200 couldn't make across the river, the other 400 went. They were so tired they couldn't even cross the river. But next thing you know, they came across them, and they attacked them for 24 hours straight and destroyed everything they had, or destroyed them, and kept, got their wives back, got their children back, got their, uh, their uh, items back, and also got their stuff back. See, God gave them a blessing, and they came back with everything, right? And so when David came back, all the places he had been hiding out in Judah from Saul, he went and rewarded them, and he said, here's a little present from the Lord. And to you guys, here's a little present from the Lord. And to you guys, here's a little present from the Lord. Again, God took him to the place where he had nothing. No wives, no children, no men, no livestock, no possessions, no nothing. And left him there to see what he would do. And what did David do? He decided to encourage himself in the Lord and trust in the Lord. So he passed the test because he simply went to God in whom he trusted. And what did, how did God respond to that? He completely took away everything. Think about that. To have everything stripped from you, and he passed the test. And how does God respond? He's going to start making him king. It's a process. But Saul is no longer going to chase him no more. Right? And so, who does that remind you of? Do you know anybody else who gave up everything and became nothing and just to become king again? The Lord. Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And because why? Because David is a type of Christ. This is what it says in Philippians 2. Let this be the mind that in, let this be, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. See, Brother John was asking for that right now. Remember, we just prayed for that he would have the mind of Christ. Here it is. What is the mind of Christ Jesus? Here it is. Verse 6. Who, so being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of the court of death, even the death of the cross. Can you imagine? Who would do that? Who would leave their glory, their crown, their position? I mean, hey, I remember this one time, God on a few story, the sister very close to the Lord, and when she was telling me this, I could feel like the Holy Spirit immediately confirm all this. And it was almost like I could feel what she was seeing. And the Lord had given her a vision. And so in the vision, she saw like, like millions of angels. It was like standing in the field. But all of a sudden, it was like the wind started coming through them. Because they all started partying. You know how like you look at a sea when you go to the hills and you see the wind coming and it just kind of goes through the braids of grass, right? That's what was happening. But they, it, they weren't partying, because they were partying for a reason. The reason is because they were partying and they were all kneeling. And she said that she looked to see what they were all kneeling at. And she said the person that was coming was walking with all the power and authority of heaven, of God Almighty. And it was Jesus. And I remember when she told me that, the Holy Spirit fell. And I could feel that, what she saw. And I was like, wow. And she saw him walk up, and all the angels, all of them were taking a step back and were all bowing down with their face to the ground. And he came and he, he said something to her, right? He gave that all up. So he was born in a manger with cows and goats. And then he grew up as nothing, a carpenter's son. And then for three and a half years to teach us about God, with meekness and humility, and then to go to the cross and die for us. Right, verse 9 says this, Therefore God has also highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of all those on the earth, and of those under the earth. 
And that every and tongue should confess that Jesus Christ, Christ is Lord, Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father. Amen. And even Jesus left everything and humbled himself to nothing. Amen. Literally, he had nothing. He was on a cross. He didn't even have any clothes. Jesus. And he gave up his soul. And he just he put it down for, for the Father, for all of us, right? But upon his death, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that's above all names. And at his name, every knee should bow, and in those in heaven, and every tongue will confess to the glory of God. It's just so beautiful. So we see a little picture of that in David, right? It's a, he's a type of Christ. Okay, and so let's all move to, uh, we're in First Samuel chapter 31, and Sister Michelle, she has verses 1 and 2. The Philistines fought a battle against the Israelites on Mount Gilboa. Many Israelites were killed there, and the rest of them, including King Saul and his sons, fled. But the Philistines caught up with them and killed three of Saul's sons, Jonathan, um, Aban, Aban, Abinadab, oh, Abinadab, and Malchusha. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... Do you want me to read three? No, no, right there. So these are all Saul's okay. sons, right? And so that's what happened. So the Philistines came, and they just completely destroyed them, which we already knew. How do we know? Because in verse, uh, chapter 30, the over the 29, the, the witch brought up Samuel. And Samuel came up and said, hey, why are you disturbing my, my rest? And he said, well, God's not talking to me. And he said, well, what can I do? You've become his enemy now. And tomorrow you're going to lose the battle. And you guys are going to be all here with me. And so here's, here's the fulfillment of this. Okay, verse 3 and 4, that would be Jacob. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell on it. Okay, so what happened here is that he got he got hit by the archers, right? He's telling his armor bearer, "Just I'm not dead yet, just kill me." But he was afraid to do that. He said, "I'm not going to do that." And so, uh, but Saul ended up committing suicide, right? There was someone else who turned on God and committed suicide. Anybody remember who that was? Judas. 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 That's right. It was Judas. Yeah. Okay, verses 5 and 6, that would be Sister Deborah. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. Okay, so here comes the tragedy, right? And all this, why? Because Saul's disobedience affected everyone else around him. And it's just the way it works. Especially if you get a direct word from the Lord and you disobey him, it's going to affect other people. Don't forgive you, but it's going to affect other people. So you got to think about that. When God gives you a, a command or needs you to go do something or go to talk to somebody, if you don't do it, there's going to be, you know, he'll forgive you, but there may be consequences. And so he may want you to go pray for someone. He may want you to give somebody money, whatever it is, right? If we don't do it, there's usually consequences and pain for others, not just for ourselves. Okay, verse 7 and 8, that would be Sister Sophia. And when the men of Israel, who were on the other side of the valley, and those who were on the other side of the Jordan, saw that the men of Israel had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forced up the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the plain, Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. Okay, so here we go. So they lost the battle, the Philistines, uh, everyone, and then everyone's watching this, right? In the cities, they fled from the cities. And so the Philistines now take over the city. And so now they're living in their houses. They're like, I like this house. This house has a three bedroom, a nice view, and a, and a swimming pool. I'll, I'll live in here. And so they just completely take over. 
And none of this needed to happen. Right? It first started with Israel because they told God they wanted a man king. That's where it all started with. You remember? And so he gave them Saul. And he tried to help Saul. But Saul disobeyed him. And he took away the kingship. And he took away his Holy Spirit. And instead he gave him a, a tormenting spirit. And now here we are. Saul's dead. His sons are dead. The Philistines are ruling the land there. And it is all bad. Verse 9 and 10 is Juan Ro. Juan, are you there? You might be on mute. John or who? I'm sorry, Juan. How was that, how was that mute? Sorry about that. Okay. Is it John or who? 9 and 10. Yep. Oh, Juan. So 9 and 10. Yep. And they cut off, the, off the, his head and stripped off his armor. And it went and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it is the temple of their idols and among their, the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Astro... I can't pronounce that. Astro... 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 And they fastened, fastened the, his body to the wall of Jack... John, that's John? Yep. Okay, right. so here we go. So they, they killed Saul, they, 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 they cut off his head, they stripped off his armor, and they went through all the land of the Philistines, right? And so, and the Philistines did this. In fact, uh, earlier in the chapter, you'll see in the book of Judges that the Ark of the Covenant, the, Israel was disobedient to God. And so they would just try to use God. And so they were bad, I wasn't doing good, so they called for the Ark, but they never talked to God. And so the Ark of the Covenant came in, and, and all Israel shouted, and the Philistines were like, well, what's going on over there? And they said, I don't know. And they said, oh, man, they brought the Ark of the Covenant. But what happened? God still wasn't with them, because they were just trying to use him. And so what did they do? They captured the Ark. And the first thing they did is they took it to their temple. Right? And so because they're trying to show that their God triumphed over the Israel God. But when the Ark of the Covenant was in the temple... Their God named Dagon, in the morning, they found him face down before the ark. So they put, and it's, it's like a funny story, but they put him upright, got him back up on his little stool there, and then the next day he was down on his face, but this time, I think it was head and his face, and his hands were broken. And they were like, oh man, our God is no match for their God. We got to get this ark of the coming out of here. And so they, they consulted all their all their spiritualists and all that, and they decided to send it back on a, on a cart. But in either case, see, this, 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 this is all bad. They ask for a man king, and they reject God. He gives them Saul. He disobeys him, right? And now God restrain, uh, withdraws his power. Now they, they lose to the Philistines. And now they're humiliating, and they're actually tarnishing the name of the Lord. That's why they took his armor. They're, they're saying, this is God's king. And look, we have his armor, we beheaded him. And that's why you're going to see that they're going to uh, fasten his body to the wall so everybody can see it, right? Because there's demonic spirits working in the background here. Okay, verse 11 and 12, that would be Brother Donnie. 11 and 12. And okay. with, uh, can you no. hear me? No, 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 Donnie, Donnie, John, you're after Donnie. So Donnie, oh. no, let me see. You're, you're after John, you're after Leslie. So you still got about four people. Brother Donnie, you got verses 11 and 12. Okay, now when the inhabitants of Jebesh Gleed heard the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men rose and walked all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the wall of Bethshan. And then they came to Jebesh and burned them there. Okay, go ahead and read verse 13 and finish that chapter. Okay, they took their bones and buried them under the, the Tamarith tree at Jebesh, and fasted seven days. Okay, so they were, these are the men of Jebesh, Gilead, and so to me, it was like he did this to honor the Lord, right? Because these guys are trying to display this king to say, hey, God couldn't protect his own king. And that's why they had his bodily up there, right? And they nailed it up there, him and I think his sons as well. So these guys went all night long, got there, 
and took down their bodies. They buried the, the, the bodies and they, and they burned the bones. And so we go, here we go now. Now we're going to the next book, which is Second Samuel, uh, verse 1. And Patricia Sacramento is going to read verses 1 and 2 now. Sister Patricia, are you there? You might be on mute. Okay, we'll have to skip her. So, Brother Calvin, you got verses 1 and 2. Now it came about after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, that David remained two days in Ziklag. On the third day, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with the clothes, with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And it came about when he came to David that he fell down to the ground and prostrated himself. Okay, so here we go. So, you know, after, remember David, because he went out there and to destroy the people that, 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 that ripped them off and took his wives and his children and that of his men and all that. Remember, those guys were the Amalekites. See how these guys keep popping up. The enemies of God keep popping up here. That one group, these Amalekites. Man, I never noticed that, but they're all over the place. Yeah. They must, they must, these guys are like the mob. They got their little secret informants, and they're just all over the place. But anyway, so yeah. David comes back from, from attacking the Amalekites. Now he hears this news, that Israel lost the battle, yeah. and that Saul is dead. Okay, verse 3 and 4, that would be... I would not you. Oh, okay. How about Patricia? You want to be uh, read verses 3 and 4 now? Okay, fine. Then David, okay. said to him, then David said to him, From where do you come? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, How do things go? Please tell me. And he said, The people have fled from the battle, and also many of the people have fallen and are dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are all so dead. Okay, so here we go. Here's the recorder. He saw it all. He told them everything that happened, right? And so now David is hearing this for the first time. Okay? Sister Leslie, verses 5 and 6. So David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? Then the young man who told him said, As I happened by chance to be on Mount Giloa, there was Saul, leaning on his spear, and indeed the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Okay, so he's giving them a play-by-play. -play. Again, they didn't have CNN coverage, Fox News, ABC, NBC, they didn't have none of that stuff. Right, so he's just going and telling them what he saw. Okay, verse 7 and 8, that would be Brother John. <clears throat> and when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am Amalek. Okay. Amalekite. So, Amalekite. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So he asked him, He's telling the story. So he called and he said, who are you, right? And he said, I'm an Amalekite, okay? And here they go again, right? Verse 9 and 10. Uh, that would be Sister Michelle. Then he said, come here and kill me. I have been badly wounded, and I am about to die. So I went up to him and killed him, because I knew that he would die anyways. As soon as he fell, <clears throat> then I took the crown from his head and his and the bracelet from his arm and have brought him to you, sir. Okay, so what he's saying is uh, this was kind of like assisted suicide. So he was hurt, he was damaged, he just happened to be the guy that was there, and he said, kill me. And so he knew that he wasn't going to live, and so he took his life, which is wrong, right? Remember, the, the armor bearer wouldn't do that, right? And so, but here's a question. Israel, they're fighting. They're fighting the Philistines. How did this guy show up out of nowhere and he didn't kill Saul? We 
read where it's read in the Bible. The Bible told us that Saul fell on his sword and committed suicide himself. He's trying to say that he did this. Why? Because he's going to try to make it seem like, I'm with you, David. This guy was your enemy. He was chasing you. Plus, he was hurt. And so I did the right thing. And so I killed him. And I brought the crown and all the gold back to you. Okay? And again, what kind of person is this? What's his nationality? Amalekite. Okay. He's an Amalekite. Yeah. So these Amalekites are the enemies of God. And they're very crafty, apparently. Okay? We'll see how God has, uh, how David responds to this man. Because again, one of the gifts of being, you know, filled and touched with the Holy Spirit, there's a gift called discerning of spirits, right? Where God gives you discernment and He gives you wisdom and understanding. And so sometimes you look at somebody like something doesn't feel right here, something doesn't sound right. And so you step back. So we're going to see if that happens with David. Okay, verse 11 and 12, that would be Jacob. Therefore David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Okay, so this was Saul who chased King David around for many, many years all around the countryside. Remember? And, and David just did good things for him. He, he became his son-in-law, and twice he could have killed him. And both times he showed him he could have killed him, but he said, there's no evil in me. I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. Over and over he would say that. And Saul so said, I understand. Uh, you know, I just I don't know what's in my mind, but I'm not going to harm you. But then he changes his mind and tries to harm him again. And so even after all those things, David here still rips his clothes, which is the sign of the worst kind of, uh, um, how should I say it, uh, when you're super, super sad, that's what that means when they rip their clothes. They would literally rip their clothes from, from the middle the all the way down. Yeah, the, the like when you're lost. Yeah. Anything that shows extreme uh, emotion, that's what they would do. And so that's what he did. He ripped his clothes. They were and torn. His, they were torn yeah. inside. Yeah, yeah, that's what it meant. Yes, they were torn inside. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul. And for Jonathan, his son, and all the people of the Lord, for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Because they were not only the only ones that got killed. There was also many of the soldiers from Israel. Okay? Verse 24 in the, in the book of Proverbs says this. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Let the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's right, and that, that's Proverbs 24, verse 17 and 18. By the way, who wrote Proverbs, the book of Proverbs? Does anybody know? King Solomon. Yeah, King Solomon. Solomon. And he was, he was a son of who? David. 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 That's right. So here we go. Verse 13 and 14, that would be Sister Deborah. And David said to a young man, Man, who are you? Who are you from? Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien, and I am a Melophite. So David said to him, How was it you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Okay, so now here comes the servant. So now, after David Moore's ripped his clothes, all those different things, now he goes back to this because, hey, he said to the other man, who, who told him? Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. Right? Now, the, Amal the Amalekites came from this guy named Amalek, who was one of the sons of Esau. And if you remember, Esau persecuted Jacob, right? And so, again, uh, they were twins. And so, this is one of his sons. But again, it was the Amal Amalekites who, who went after Israel and Moses led in the 2.2 million people and attacked them from behind and killed, again, all the cripples, all the old people, all the children. That's how they do it. And see how he's trying to weasel himself in here, right? So now all of a sudden, something, David felt something. Like, something's not right. So he asked him again. 
And he says, hey, how was it you're not afraid to strike down the Lord's anointed? Right? Which he didn't even do. Paul fell on his own sword to put himself out of his misery. Okay, I got a question really quick. Yeah. Um, when Esau's brother Jacob, when the Lord changed his name to Israel, was Israel uh, a country before that or after the after he changed his name? After. After, yeah. okay. Yeah, right. so, so uh, Jacob's name was Israel, which meant the planner. And Israel right. means, I think, one who... Uh, now I remember, but he, 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 he because he wrestled with God, and he ended up uh, with almost like he was almost victorious in that. And so I don't remember what Israel means. I have to look that up. And he, you know, it's something good. Sure. He changed his name to, to Israel. And sure. So, yeah. And then uh, is, uh, Israel had twelve sons. Jacob had twelve sons, and that's the tribes of uh, of uh, Israel. And then when they went to Egypt, there were seventy of them. When they left Egypt 430 years later, there was two, about 2.2 million, and then there were a nation. Okay. And then God brought them into, into the, uh, where, where Israel is now. Cool, that answers and, my question. Yep, yeah, okay, and so 15 and 16 is, uh, who read that? Now I'm a little lost. I think it was Deborah, right? So, Sophia, 15 and 16. David called up his three men and said, Go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. But David said to him, Your blood is on your own head. Your own mouth is passed out against you. Saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Okay, so here we go. Again, what he told him wasn't even true. He did not kill him. Saul fell on his own sword. But he's trying to work some agenda here. Maybe try to get close to David, I'm not quite sure. But that's what it seems to me. He's kind of strategizing, finagling, trying to get himself close to the throne because he knows David is going to be uh, king. Right? That's why he brought him the crown. See how the enemy works these things? And is always trying to get close to the crown, close to where authority is at. In fact, uh, Pharaoh, if you remember, he, uh, when Moses came in and threw down, and Pharaoh was the, was king of Egypt, mm -hmm. but he was also the most powerful man in the world, right? And when yeah. Moses threw down his rod, and it became a snake, Pharaoh asked his priest, hey, can you guys do the same thing? And what happened? Were they able to do the same thing? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they were able to do the same thing, and those two rods became snakes too. The difference being that Moses' the snake ate those other two snakes. Uh, but here's something that's just like, yeah, but here's something that's just super interesting. If you look, the other three plagues, the next three or four plagues that came, the priests didn't stop them. They didn't try to stop them. All they tried to do is copy them, and they were able to do it. Right? And so the word in the Hebrew is they used enchantment. New age. But in this, yeah, okay, so this, that's what they used to, to copy the plagues of God. But when Moses threw down his rod and those priests threw down their rod, it's translated enchantments, but the word is not enchantment. The word is something like la, la, la and it's only used one other time in the Bible. And do you know what time that it, when it, where it's used at? The only other time it's used at is for the sword of the cherubs who stand at the Garden of Eden protecting the tree of life. Wow. Oh. Wow. And so why is that important? This is the reason. Because there was no ordinary demonic activity with, when the snake started, uh, when he, the snake, the, the staff turned into a uh, snake. The lalet signifies the sword of a cherub. And so what cherub just happened to be there with Pharaoh overseeing this whole deal? Anybody know? Lucifer. Yeah. Lucifer, that's right. <laughs> The same thing is uh, evil, evil and good at the same time? Yeah, no, it, it's just complete evil. And so the thing is this, Satan is very close to where the uh, worldly powers are. He's no dummy. That's where he's hanging out. He's hanging out with the Russian president, maybe with you know Congress over here in the U.S. He's running the show. 
don't publish it out in the Philippines because they're just going to say, hey, we're number one. We're number one. They say, don't publicize it because the Philistine will rejoice and, and the women over there will dance. Verse 21 and 22. That's Sister Patricia in Sacramento. Pastor, Pastor the, 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 uh, the number 20 says at the end, says, let the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Uh-huh. Yes. And so, yeah, what they would call, because Israel was circumcised, right? That was one of the commandments of the Lord, for the men to be circumcised. And so that's one of the ways they applied it to the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. Okay, that's what's being said there. Oh, okay. You, okay, Pass 21 and 22, Sister Patricia. You might be on mute, Sister Patricia. Again. Okay, Sister, okay. are you there? Yes. Oh, my okay. of Gilboa, let not dew or rain be on you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. You want me to go on? Yes, 22. Yeah. Okay. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty. The bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. So he's, you know, kind of glorifying them and showing them, right, the things that they had done. One thing, just bring a little attention here. It says the shield of Saul was not anointed with oil. Oil is always the picture of the Holy Spirit, and so we can see that, right, because God took his spirit from Saul, from Saul. Okay, verse 23 and 24 be Saul and Jonathan, beloved, pleasant in their life, and in their death, they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you look luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. Okay, so see how we see the heart of, of, of David here, right? And we can see the grace of God on it. Because most people would say, well, he said he was chasing me around, and now I'm king. And so thank you for bringing me his crown. Thank you for bringing him his gold. By the way, did he have the national credit card? Because I'm about to go on a, on, a, on a street here. I'm about to move into the palace. I want to buy new stuff. I want to get all the pictures up. I want to get my two wives in there. That's what I'm thinking about. He wasn't thinking about that. He's writing a song about Saul who ended up persecuting him for all these years. And his friend Jonathan. It's just amazing. Verse 25 and 26. That would be Sister Leslie. Called the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Okay, go ahead and read that verse 27, that last verse there. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. Okay, so we already read this. So Jonathan, when, when David was being persecuted, everything was being taken from him, when he was there and with Saul, remember, he used to play the music for Saul to get rid of that distressing spirit. And next thing you know, and then he, he beat Goliath, he, and he won that. And then he, he was going out, and then all of a sudden started to get jealous of him because the women started singing this song. Saul has laid his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And so when all that was going on, God sent Jonathan to be his friend. And Jonathan said, no, nothing's going to happen to you. I'm sure Saul, my dad, would tell me if he's going to try to hurt you, and he found out that he was, so he sent David away. And so they made a covenant that day, and Jonathan said, when you become king, just don't kill my house. You know, take care, and he promised that he would, and we actually saw that he did that, right? But I wanted to show you something, is that Jonathan was a man of faith. We kind of skipped over him because we've been covering the, the, the story of David. But we're going to come and take a look at it real quick, because he was a man of faith. But there was a difference between him and David, and we're going to see what that difference is. So let's all skip to go back to First Samuel chapter 14, and we're going to just see a quick encounter here. Okay, first Samuel. Yep. So go back to the previous book. And we're gonna go to we're gonna begin at verse six. So everybody go back to first Samuel chapter fourteen. Verse 
team. And we're going to look at this thing with Jonathan. And beginning at verse 6, it should say, then Jonathan. And so, Brother John, you got that one. Okay? I got that one? Yep, yep. So, verse 7, oh, thank you. Chapter, okay. Chapter yeah, 14, man. you got verses 6 and 7. Six and seven. Okay, thank you. And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, that war, is that bear is the same thing as war, his armor, I think. Come and let us go over unto the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no retrain to the Lord to save by many but or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that it is in thy heart, turn thee, behold I am with thee according to thy heart. Okay, so here we go. This is again before uh Jonathan was Saul was king, Jonathan was serving his father, and so the Philistines there was always battle between Israel and the Philistines at that time, right? And so Saul said, Come on. Let's go. Now look at this faith. This is a famous verse in the Bible, but I don't hear it preached on too much anymore. So he goes and he takes his armor bearer and he says this. Come, let us go over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. Right? It may be, look at this, that the Lord will work for us. Here we go. For nothing restrains the, the Lord from saving by many or by few. What he's saying is that the Lord can, can save you by uh, using a thousand men. Or he could, he could, he could see it, give you the victory by only using two men. It doesn't matter to the Lord. This is faith, right? But here's something, though. So he's got great faith, right? You don't need a whole army. You don't need a whole ministry. All you need is you and God. And that's it, right? But here's the thing that, that, that caught my attention. First of all, he says, it may be that the Lord w will work for us. Now, what, what, what? what the reason it catches my attention is that he's talking about God. But see, King David, King David doesn't talk about God. King David talks to God. There's a difference. You see the difference? Yeah. Well, faith is good. A great faith is great. But you need to have a relationship with God. That's even more important. Psalm 20, verse 7 says this. Some trust in chariots. And some in horses. But so we will remember the name of the Lord our God. See how that's much more personal? By the way, that's Psalms 20, verse 7. Who wrote that? David. Oh, David. That's right. You guys got it. Almost all the right answers are always David. David, David. He wrote that. See how there's a relationship there? We spend a lot of and time so again, with the word. Yeah, that's it. He let him know all the time. Talking to him, worshiping, writing about him, telling people about him. He talked about God. But in between talking about God, he would start talking to God. It's the most amazing thing. We got to be like David. Yeah, we want to have faith. But we want to know God. We want to talk to God. We want to spend time with God. We don't want just to say, maybe God will work for us. No, no, no. That's not oh. but you know what? God's not, God's not our servant. We're His servant. He's Amen. our Lord. We need to go to Him and say, Lord, what do you think about these guys? These guys are dishonoring you. Do you want me to go over there? And He might say, yes, I'll be with you. and might say, no, but we, He's the master. But it's so interesting that God looks for faith. And even though Jonathan and David didn't have a good relationship with him, didn't know him personally, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it. But God said, you know what? Because he trusts in me to the point of his own death, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it for that guy. And so we're gonna see this is gonna get this is gonna get very interesting. Uh, I'm not confused First, there. Okay. Well okay, let, let me let me finish reading and then we'll go back and answer any questions. Verse eight and nine, that would be that's sister left, have you read? Uh yes, I read. Oh, oh, so, okay, John just read. So, 8 9 would be Michelle. I think. Okay. All right, Jonathan said, We will go across and let the Philistines see us. If they tell us to wait for them to come to us, then we will 
and we will yeah. stay where we are. Okay, first line. Sorry, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that was first night. If they tell oh. us to wait for them to come to us, then we will stay where we are. Okay, so what they're saying is, yeah, you know, that's like, so what he's saying is this, this is our sign from God. So if, if they say, stay there, we know that God hasn't given us the victory. But if they say, come up here, we know God has given us the victory, right? So here's the thing is that, in all this, he never asked the Lord. But the Lord is just so gracious, he says, I'm going to honor that. Because these guys are about to risk their life. There's 25 guys standing up on a hill. And there's only two of them. There is no way anybody's going to win that battle unless God's fighting with you. And he's ready to lay it down. But he see how he came up with almost with his own rule. He almost said, okay, he's saying, hey, if they say come up here, God has given us a victory. But if they say don't say that, then he hasn't given us a victory, right? But nowhere do you hear God talking to him. See, for David was different. He said, Lord, will you go, will, will you give us a battle? And he said, I will give him a battle. Then he goes back and tells his men, and his men say, I don't think so, Dave. There are a lot of guys, and those guys are well trained. I don't think so. You better ask God again. So David runs back over to the Lord and says, Lord, did I hear you right? Did you did you say to go, that you give us the battle? He says, surely I will give you the battle. And he runs back, and he doesn't ask his men anymore. He just takes them off. He says, we're going. But see, you don't see that here. He, he, he's trusting God, but not in relationship. Like, and, I, and I'm telling you, I got caught like this. It's very easy to do when well, you're operating from faith, but not in a relationship where well, you're talking with them. And say, because he might say, no, you know, he might, he might, it pleases me that you trust me, but that's not for you to do. I have to talk to for, I have someone else to do that for you or for me, whatever it is, right? Again, verse 10 and 11, that would be Jacob. Oh, yeah. We're in uh, first, uh, Samuel chapter 14, verses uh, 10 and 11. Okay. But if they say that, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hands, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Hit it. So these guys were hidden? And now they see Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they're saying, hey, the, the Hebrews are starting to come out of their hole. Right, so now they're going to speak to them. Let's see what they say, verse 12 and 13, that's Sister Deborah. In the name of the Jonathan, called to Jonathan, and his armor bearer, and said, come, up to see us, and we will show you something. Jonathan said to the armor bearer, Come up after thee, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Okay, verse 13. Oh. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed his bell. Okay, so here we go. So they, they just called in and said, hey, the Hebrews are coming out of their caves. What's going on here, right? And they said, hey, you two, come up here. We're going to show you something, like mocking them, right? And Jonathan said, hey, there's the code word. God is going to give us the victory, right? And God honors that. So they go up, two guys against 25 guys, and those 25 guys are up on the hill. Now, the reason they stand up on the hill, it's easier to defend the hill, because you're, you're, you're fighting against people who are trying to climb up, so you can spear them. So there is no way that two guys, and one guy being a soldier, the other guy just being an armor bearer, are going to kill 25 soldiers, but it's going to happen. Why? Because God is going to honor them. Okay, verses 14 and 15, that'll be Sister Sophia. And I was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, and it was a very great trembling. Now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away, and they went here and there. 
Okay, so here we go. So first, the slaughter which Jonathan and Arbor made was about 25 men and about half an acre of land, okay? Only two guys, half an acre of land, took down 25 guys. And there was trembling in the camp. What? What, what do you mean there's trembling in the camp? Where's that come uh, from? In the camp. field. And among all the people, the garrison and the raiders, raiders also trembled. And the earth quaked. So that it was very great trembling. Are you kidding me? Jonathan wow. just said, man, I've got so much faith in God. I believe he's going to give us a victory just with two guys. One soldier, wow. one armor bearer. And the armor bearer said, let's do it. Hey, if God did it, I'm going. And so they go. And what happens? They kill these 25 guys on half an acre, one soldier, one armor bearer. But they got God Almighty. And God said, hey, wait a minute. I'm not due. I'm not done yet. Like my friend Emilio says, sometimes Jesus is on his throne and he just wants to flex his muscles a little. And that's what's happening here. Boy, he just started trembling the camp. People are saying, whoa, it's trembling. What's going on here? Because God's moving. And the raiders trembled. And here we go. And the earth quaked. Are you kidding me? I want to be around there when God's doing these kinds of things. And God's shaking the whole earth. Man, oh. he's not playing. He's not having it. And look at this, great faith can not only move mountains, it can shake the whole earth. Oh, no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Wow, okay. Yep, brother, come and go ahead. Jesus is yo. <laughs> <laughs> he sure is. And when he comes out to battle, and we know in verse chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, he's coming out to battle and he's got a different garment on. And this one says that he it, it has, uh, it, and it's dipped in blood. Not his blood, but the blood of his enemies, because he is undefeated. If you remember in the book of Isaiah, they came and they were talking God, they were mocking God, they they don't trust in God, God's not going to do nothing for you. And the king didn't get scared, all he said is, give me their right. And he went out to the temple and ruled and he said, God, they said this about you. They didn't say this about me. They're saying this about you. The prophet couldn't even leave. And God spoke and said, go back in there. You go tell them now. The battle is not theirs. I'm coming out the battle. And so they didn't do nothing. That night, one angel, it says, the angel of the Lord. And who's the angel of the Lord? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. And he killed how many people? 185,000 soldiers in one night. Wow. Boom. That's our God, right? We need to rejoice in those things. Okay, so now I'm a little lost. Verse 16 and 17. Who read last, by the way? Now I'm a little lost. Deborah, who, 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 Deborah, or who read last? And I think I made it with okay. me. Okay, Sophia, okay, so one row, you got 16 and 17. One, you might be on mute. Okay. Uh, okay. Final. Okay. 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 It's First Samuel. It's First Samuel. Yep. Chapter fourteen. Okay. And 16 and 17. 16 and 17. Okay. Okay. Yep. And, and there was trouble in the camp. In the field. I think we read that. First six, oh. sixteen and seventeen. Sixteen and seventeen. All right. Sixteen. 16. Now the watch, watchman of the Saul, of Saul and Gala, Gala of Bethlehemia, Bethlehemia looked, and there was a multitude and melting away, and they went here and there. Then Saul said to the, to the people who were with him, Now call the, the roll and see who has gone from us. And when they have called the roll, they're finally Jonathan and his armor and his armor bear were not there. Okay, so what happens is they're trembling, they're shaking, people are dying, they're running, and so it's like, what the heck is going on here? God's moving, and they say, well, take a roll call, let's see who's missing. And surprisingly, Jonathan, because it's just Jonathan and his armor bearer. And now Israel's going to say, hey, God's on the move. Let's go join in the battle. And again, that's a super important lesson for us. 
when God is on the move and we notice that he's battling, we need to jump in that battle. He expects us to jump in that battle. And so, when is God on the move? When is he battling? I can tell you, he was in the move a few weeks ago. He was on the move in San Francisco because people were hearing the gospel. He was during the whole corona deal, the whole social distancing, the whole mass thing. That didn't matter to God. He was out there and he had his people preaching the gospel and people were hearing the gospel and being saved. That's what God did. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. Brother Tom, verse 18 and 19. Okay. And so said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here, for the ark of God was that time with the sons of Israel. For four o'clock to the breeze, the, the commotion in the town of Philistine continued and increased. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Okay, so here we go. They bring the Ark of the Covenant, right? And that was the presence of God. And it says, but at that time, the Ark of the Covenant was there. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. Because they're being rattled. God is on the move, right? And so now Saul's going to get rattled. What you should have done, because God's on the move. He's fighting the battle. Right? And so this is so interesting. The priest, it says, withdraw your hand. The priest is on an emergency 911 call to God. That's why they brought the Ark of the Covenant. And Saul, so, because he gets rattled naturally, because he's walking in by, by the flesh, by sight, not by faith, he tells the priest, withdraw your hand. That's like hanging up the line with God on the phone. You see the difference between David? David would have kept praying and asking the Lord, is this from you? Do you want us to join the battle? What do you want us to do? But not Saul. He sees all this stuff. He says, oh, take your hand away from there and stop. Oh, That's exactly oh. what happened. See, we don't want to be like that. That's why it's so important not only to have faith, but to have that relationship with God. You have to have a relationship with God. It's not enough talking about God. you got to be talking to God. You gotta be sitting down with him. You gotta be yeah. fellowshipping with him. You gotta be going on a walk on the beach with him. Not with yeah. your boyfriend, not with your girlfriend, with him. You gotta be going out to dinner with him, spending time with him. That's what he's looking for. Okay, verse twenty and twenty one, that's sister Patricia. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle, and behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was very great confusion. Now the okay. Hebrews were okay. No, go ahead, verse twenty-one. Okay. Now the Hebrews who were with the Philistines previously, who went up with them all around in the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites, who were with Saul and Jonathan. There we go. So now everybody's joining in the party. Hey, God's here, God's fighting, and I want to get part of this victory. It's just like you ever see these people, like when all of a sudden the 49ers are doing good, or the Giants, or the Golden State Warriors, everybody just all of a sudden becomes one of those fans. Well, this is yeah. kind of like that. God's fighting, and everybody's like, oh, I'm fighting with God's army now. Why? Because he's winning, and he's undefeated, and he's on his horse, and he's, he, he's doing this whole thing. And so uh, he had he had their swords turned everyone on his man. God is cleaning up this whole deal right here. He's kicking butt. What is it called? He's kicking names and kicking butt. Okay? Verse twenty two and twenty three, that'll be Brother Kelvin. When all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill in the hill hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines had fled, even they even they also pursued them closely in battle. So the, so the Lord delivered Israel that day. The battle spread beyond Beth, Beth Haven. Okay, here we go. So Israel, the men were hiding in caves. They're afraid of the Philistines. They're hiding in caves. But when the Lord shows up, even they came out and were fighting. Right? Because the Lord is there. And in verse 23, so the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Haven, right? 
So picture that. They were on the defensive. They were hiding in caves. They were afraid of the Philistines. But all of a sudden, God shows up and gives one soldier and an armor bearer the victory over 25 people. And then he starts shaking the camp. And then he starts shaking the whole earth. And he says, hey, I'm here. Let's get to the battle. So these guys are running out of their caves. They're all hiding. They were peeking behind rocks. And now they're running out with their sword. And the God gives them the, the, the deliverance. He killed, he killed them all, right? He, he won. It says right there, he saved Israel. And how did this all start? Because one guy named Jonathan took his armor to her and said, come on, let's just go see if God will give us a victory. Let's just see if he'll do it for us. Because he doesn't need a whole army. He can just do it with us too right here. That's what started. Great faith is great. Again, we talked about that. We just saw what faith can do. When you put it all on the line, and you risk it all, God will answer. In fact, you know, my, my friend Ben, who wrote that book, he talks about that. He said, everybody has a little bit of faith. And so if God tells them to walk across a two-by-four, if they're six inches off the ground, they'll do it. But if God says to walk over that same two-by-four, two but it's over a ten-story building, now people are saying, no, I'm not going to do that. But see, that's the kind of faith God is looking for. Where you need Him... Or you're going to die. When you completely trust God, and say, Lord, I put all my trust in you. And it may be not that. It might be they call your chip, Lord, I'm investing in this because I feel you want me to invest in. Or I want to give to this ministry so I feel, even though this is a book in the eye, unless you act on my behalf, Lord, I'm going to go down, but I trust that you're going to come through for me. And Psalm 27, it says this. Now again, faith is great, faith is great, but it's nothing without a relationship that's centered in a love for God. It has to be centered in a love for God. Psalm 27 says this, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Who wrote that? Anybody know? David. David, right. David. King David. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 13 says this. And now abide in faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. That's what the Lord, he loves faith. He loves when we reverence him, when we honor him. But the thing he loves the most is when we love him. Oh, just love him. We just worship him. Not because Paul he wrote tells that. us to, but because he wants to. What? Yeah, Paul wrote that. Yeah, Paul wrote that. Yeah, but the Psalm 27. I mean, to me, that's just a powerful verse. Can you imagine being there and God telling you personally? You're just walking one day, you're walking to the store to get something to eat, and all of a sudden he says, Seek my face. And when he speaks to you, Seek my face, you tell him, My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Can you imagine that? God's heart probably melting at that point. But I wonder what thing. Most of us would kind of think about it like, what does that mean? Let me call brother such and such or sister such and such and see how I, I should respond. Now, Dave, he says, Lord, my heart says to you, your face I will see. That's how much you love God. Amen. Okay, Brother Donnie, do you have a song to close out and worship with? I do. We do a song called This is Amazing Grace by Bill Wickham. Here we go.